Ew. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm Tom the Tech Chap, and this is the new 2019, well, slash early 2020, Acer Swift 5. And while we'll talk about the specs and the screen and everything else in a second, the first thing you want to do with a Swift 5 is just pick it up and throw it around a bit because it's so ridiculously lightweight. It's a 14 inch laptop that weighs 990 grams, less than a kilogram. Now, of course, being really lightweight isn't exactly new for the Swift 5. That's kind of one of its USPs. But now with this new 2019 version, we get 10th generation Intel processors with specs that include the new Iris Plus graphics and also options for Nvidia's MX250 graphics chip. So while it's still incredibly light, it's now a lot more powerful. If you're after a high spec ultra portable, then the Swift 5 is well worth a look. And it goes up against the likes of the LG Gram 14, the Asus ZenBook 14, Dell XPS 13, Lenovo Yoga C940, and the latest Microsoft Surface laptop. It weighs 25% less than the MacBook Air, despite having a quad-core CPU, a touchscreen, faster Wi-Fi 6, we get Thunderbolt 3, and much improved onboard graphics. Of course, nothing's perfect, and there are a couple of downsides, with the main one being just sort of the look and feel of it. It's a reasonably smart looking laptop, but the material that Acer used to keep it lightweight, while not technically plastic, they go to some length to say it's magnesium, lithium, something fancy. You know what, at the end of the day, it feels like plastic. Ew. There is a little bit of flex in the laptop, but overall build quality is pretty good. And I must admit, I really like this blue with gold accents color. It's also much lighter than the competition. Only the LG Ground 14 comes close, although that does have a bigger battery. And this makes it really easy to carry around in a bag. And just handling it every day feels kind of miraculous, considering that it doesn't skimp on power, especially in the higher spec trim. So the biggest upgrade here are the processors with Intel's 10th generation Ice Lake processors. And while they don't offer a huge boost in terms of raw processor performance, it's the graphics department that has seen a real upgrade, particularly if you get it with the Iris Plus chip, which is up to two times faster than the previous integrated graphics. Plus, of course, as I say, you also get the option of getting this with NVIDIA's MX250 graphics chip. And actually means you can get away with a bit of light gaming and it really comes in handy for more graphics intensive tasks like video and photo editing. The other issue is the price, because while £900, the same in dollars for the base model, isn't too bad, unfortunately that one has seriously cut down graphics. It does get 8 gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of storage, however, which is perfect for most everyday tasks. It's also the spec I've got here, and it surprised me how capable it is, considering this isn't the i7 model. I'm also glad Acer went with 256 gigs as a minimum storage, as I have an untold hatred for companies who think 128 is a reasonable base option for a laptop in 2019. You can jump up to the i7 with the MX250 and a 512 gig SSD for around £1,100. For most of us though, the i7 with Iris Plus graphics will be enough for a bit of gaming in less graphically intensive titles like Fortnite or Overwatch, if you don't mind dropping the settings a bit. You may be thinking though, why is there an option for the MX250 when we already have Iris Plus on some of these models? On paper, it may seem that there's not much of a difference, but the Nvidia card will be better supported via drivers and software. In fact, Notebook Check compared both in games and found that the MX250 had a 20-25% to advantage on average, and in some cases the increase was over 50 so if gaming is your thing, or maybe you use GPU accelerated software like the Adobe Creative Suite, then the discrete card is worth paying extra for. I thought I'd see if gaming is too much for the i5. And the answer is mostly yes. In Fortnite, I was able to hit 35 FPS using the lowest graphics settings at 720p, but needed to drop to 540p to get a more playable 45 FPS. And boy, is it ugly. Overwatch fared, well, even worse. Although I managed 45 FPS when it was working, the frame drops mean it stutters so badly it basically paused the game. So I often died well before I knew what was actually going on. It did get quite warm as well, especially underneath, but it wasn't uncomfortable, which is impressive given the cooling system is so compact, and it doesn't get particularly noisy either. The screen is Full HD 1080p, which makes perfect sense on this 14-inch display. It's matte, which keeps reflections to a minimum, and it gets reasonably bright at 300 nits. It is an IPS panel, so viewing angles and contrast are good, and while colors are vivid, it's not the most color accurate of screens. Although this isn't really a big deal unless you're editing professional level photos or video. It's also a touch screen, and while it's not essential, it is quite nice to be able to tap the screen or pinch in to zoom. The keyboard is good, if not maybe the best on a Windows machine. I think the Surface Laptop has that honor, but it's still refined and it has a sensible layout. 
Key travel is quite shallow, but it's still good enough, and the keys have a definite click to it, which helps it feel responsive. One thing that's slightly frustrating is the power button, which is positioned at the top right just like any other key. So I kept accidentally pressing it when looking for the delete button, which put the laptop into sleep mode. It's annoying, but I think I'll get used to it over time. The trackpad is a reasonable size, and my fingers glide over it fairly smoothly. Pressing down is a little bit clacky, but it still feels good quality. There's also a fingerprint sensor, which allows you to log in with Windows Hello. The 720p webcam doesn't support Windows Hello, however, so you can't log in with your face. Wi-Fi is fast and has excellent range thanks to Wi-Fi 6 support, although you'll still need a compatible router to make the most of this. Ports-wise, we get a single USB Type-C with Thunderbolt 3, so we get seriously fast transfer speeds, and the option to connect high-res external monitors, hubs, and fast storage. There's also a single USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-A, that's a bit of a mouthful, and a positively geriatric USB 2 port for some reason. We do also get HDMI, as well as a headphone jack, but unfortunately no SD card reader. Battery life is better than last year's Swift 5, but it's still fairly average compared to other 10th gen Full HD machines. I found I got around 9 hours of real world mixed use, and around 6 hours of video playback at 50% brightness. Of course, the MX250 version is bound to have an impact on battery, especially if you're doing more intensive tasks, but with power switching, it shouldn't be too bad. If you're running low, then there is fast charging, which is a great feature if you need a quick top up. I got 38% after 30 minutes with the lid closed, which isn't bad if you're in a tight spot. You can also charge it via the USB Type-C port, which is handy if you find yourself out and about without the charger. There are downfiring stereo speakers, but the results aren't great. The bass really suffers, and it just isn't that clear when it's on a table, and especially not on your lap. So the big question, should you buy the Acer Swift 5? Well, you know what? Short answer, yes. It's a terrific laptop. And aside from being maybe a little bit plasticky, well, definitely feeling a bit plasticky, and also having a good rather than great battery life, there's very little not to like here. It is a superb laptop. And the combination of the portability, given it's so lightweight, but also the solid performance with those 10th gen chips, Iris Plus graphics or MX250 chip, Wi-Fi 6, a great keyboard, a decent track, pad, although it would be nice if it was a little bit bigger. A good range of ports, including Thunderbolt 3, the matte display, which I really like. There aren't enough matte screens out there, so it handles reflections a little bit better. And I think they're smart going with Full HD as well in this 14-inch size. It really is an impressive bit of kit, and I would definitely, definitely recommend it. And if you do want to find out more, I put links in the description below. But what do you reckon? Would you go for something like this, or would you prefer to have a slightly heavier laptop that maybe feels a bit more premium. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching guys. I really hope you enjoyed the video and if you're not already sick of hearing my voice then why not click that subscribe button below and hopefully I'll see you next time right here on the Tech Chat.